Well, that, that was what my suspicion was, is that it's either this card, the Wi-Fi card in this computer, or the Wi-Fi in this room. So, we're, it is what it is. All right. Okay, if you, if you don't have sheets, we are on the Life Flight Bible Study, Session 8. And the Bible, the Bible verse sheets. We're talking about false teachers. Uh, yours truly is not one of those. these people that are back are we are we getting back into the habit and and just a reminder Shelly and I will be out of town next week so we will not have Bible class next Thursday unless one of you wants to lead it she, she's ducking <laughs> yeah no um we're going up to see her dad, so uh, we will not be in town. So we will not have uh, will not have Bible class next Thursday. So we were talking last week uh, on Second Peter two one to three about the false prophets and Jeremiah twenty three on your sheet. Um, Jeremiah 23, uh, you'll, how, how will you know a false prophet it's, you know, the, if the prophecy don't come true? Um, and what we ask the question, what false teachers or what pro- false prophets can you identify today? Um, I, I don't know that it's... There are many sheep, are wolves in sheep's clothing. They wrap themselves in the Bible, but then they say things that aren't r- truly in keeping with the Bible. Uh, and I'm going I'm to go back in history. Um, back in the 1500s, um, the, whole, the whole reason that Luther gets involved in the whole Reformation is not because he wanted to start his own church. Why did Luther start the Reformation? False teaching. Um, the, they had the Bible. The Roman Catholic Church had the Bible. In fact, they were one of the few institutions that had the Holy Scriptures at that point in time. And, and they had ancient copies of it buried in their, uh, their museums underground, in their catacombs. And, they, and remember, uh, a, a copy of the Bible at that point in time would have been about the size of this podium that I'm standing behind, the top of this podium. Um, They were huge because they were all handwritten. Uh, Luther gets the benefit of seeing and reading scripture because he's a monk. And the monasteries have copies of the Bible because they do copies of the Bible to make more Bibles. Well, by the time Luther comes around, a lot of that is done by uh, the printing press, Gutenberg's printing press, which came out, what, 100 years prior to Luther, talking about technology and how technology advances. If you go back 500 years, 600 years, and technology starts that advance and where we are today. But so Luther understands, and if you read the 95 Theses, what he's pointing out is errors that he's seen, false teaching that he's seen within the Catholic Church. And his whole goal is, let's, let's bring this out to the light of day so we can correct these errors and get back on the right path. Because they're wrapping themselves in Scripture, they're saying, we are God's church, but they're not really acting that way. Uh, now, that's different from what we're going to talk about in question number two. Um, but when we look at... Uh, 
look at the false prophets in the time of Luther, they wrapped themselves in scripture and yet the, they, they perverted or corrupted that scripture to a message that they wanted. Now, I always, uh, we, when we talked about Luther in, in seminary, if Luther had three choices, the easy way, the hard way, and a blend of the two, Luther would always choose the hardest. You know, all right, so let's talk about communion. Catholic Church, transubstantiation, changing substance, right? So the, the, the host and the wine are changed into, they transfer substance to the body and blood. When the priest holds up and says, this is my body, hocus corpus meum, and breaks the bread, it at that point becomes Christ's body and blood. Zwingli and Calvin go a much easier and much more logical route. No, 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 no. You taste the bread, you taste the wine or grape juice. Remember, they don't use wine, they use grape juice. But you taste that, so therefore it still is that. So we're just going to say that what Christ means is that it represents, or you think about my body and think about my blood when you take the bread or the wine. So they go the easy route for people and say, you know, you don't have to believe that it's really Christ's body and blood. It's what you believe and that, that you're showing that you believe that. Along comes Luther, and which does he go with? Representation or transubstantiation? Yes. So the Lutheran view is, is a blend of both of them. It's consubstantiation. And by the way, you probably haven't heard that word before. Um, if transubstantiation is changing substances, consubstantiation is double substances. So with substances. So you have the bread and the wine. Physically, you can touch, you can taste the bread and the wine. But because Christ says it's so, it is his body and blood. So the bread and wine don't cease to exist. But in, with, and under that bread and wine, by the way, very Lutheran words, in, with, and under, that's that consubstantiation. In, with, and under that bread and wine, you receive what Christ has promised, because if Christ says it, it must be so. So you receive the body and blood. And heads all over the world went, What? And, 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 but see, that's, that's what Luther does on so many things. You know, I understand that you can, you can taste and feel the, the physical. The physical is still there. However, we have to understand that Christ says it's this, therefore it must be this. You can't explain it away. So, in, in, in trying to keep with what scripture says, he doesn't necessarily tell the people what they want to hear, but he also doesn't depart from scripture. So the second question is, why are false teacher, teachers often so popular? And by the way, why was the Catholic Church so popular? They were the only one that what? In that day and age, if you received a, an official-looking letter from the Pope, the Cardinal, or the Bishop that said that because of your errors of way, you are excommunicato, you are excommunicated, where did you believe you were going? Straight to hell. There was no other option. They had been taught that from little on, and so their belief system was built around uh, if I don't do what they say, I will go to hell. And that, that's not what the people want to hear, but it, it fits a need. If life is only for what we have here, we become very humanistic. By the way, one of the false teachers we're going to talk about uh, becomes very humanistic, and it's kind of like get everything you 
you can, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. But see, the Catholic Church had changed that into an understanding of we need that relationship with God. Oh, by the way, the Pope's the only one that can provide that, and therefore you need to listen to him. If we look at 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. The feel good church. So it's what they want to hear. The false teachers are so popular because they blend a message together that is soothing to the people. Why are the prosperity churches doing so well? Don't you want to know how to have everything your heart desires? Don't you want to know how you can be blessed by God beyond imagination? And by the way, I'm not making those words up. So the prosperity gospel is you do for God and God will do for you. It's karma. It's karma wrapped up in scripture, really. Um, while we say we... We do what God requires of us because of what God has done. So it's in response for his love. We, the prosperity gospel would say, you do it so that God will love you. So it's a, it's a, a works righteousness or an earned righteousness, if you will. Um, and, and a lot of the prosperity churches, and they, they do very well because it's what people want to hear. Um, there are, they, they use scripture. Um, what? To their advantage. Jesus says to his disciples at one point, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. What did Jesus mean by that? That you should have a big house and a nice fancy car and a boat for the lake and fancy clothes and fancy jewelry, is that what Jesus is saying? That you may have life and have it abundantly. See, the, the prosperity gospel would say that's exactly what he's saying. If you believe in God strong enough and do what he requires of you, you will be blessed beyond imagination in this life. And, I, and again, I'm not making those words up. Those words come out of some of the prosperity uh, churches and people eat it up because I'm in control by the way how many of you if you were having to fly somewhere would just as soon fly the plane yourself instead of somebody else flying it if you knew how <laughs> have you ever looked at the inside of one of those cockpits I mean it, it's staggering all of the dials and all of the knobs and all of the switches and it's kind of like yeah, you, you just take care of this. I'll go sit down. Um, but we want to be in control of our own lives, our own destiny. And so the prosperity puts it in your own hands. See, Christianity doesn't do that. We make it even easier. Surrender. Admit to God that you are that you are nothing. But do we as prosperity churches try to push the doctrine of Jesus of God? A lot of them don't use it at all. Okay. Not at all. Not at all. A lot of them will don't have weddings, don't have funerals, don't have baptisms. It's just it, it, it's all that that meeting together. And by the way, they'll celebrate Easter but not Good Friday. Because Good Friday is a, a downer. It's a bummer. Um, see, we, we value Good Friday because that is the day. That's Valentine's Day for us. That's when God signs the Valentine with Christ's own blood. You know, there's no, 
no better day to understand the depth that God will go to that we would be saved. The fulfillment of the covenant. But see, for the, for the false prophets, they want to make it to where it's something you want. I've told you before, uh, many times in my ministry, I've had somebody come into my office and say, you know, Pastor, I need to know hard and fast. What do I have to do to get to heaven? And I'll say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible tells us. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. No, 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 Pastor. I, I, I know the Bible says that, but what do I have to do to be saved? And I said, what, what, what do you mean? Well, how much do I have to give? How many, how many Sundays do I have to come to church? How many Bible classes do I have to attend? How many camp retreats or church retreats do I have to go to? You know, how many cookouts do I have to come at? You know, what, what, what's the level? I said, oh, so you want to know what, what it takes to be a member here? No, 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 what, what's it take to get to heaven? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. But see, that, that takes it completely out of my hand. You know, false teachers are so popular. I mentioned humanism. The main tenet of humanism is, and it, it's a line from Shakespeare, to thine own self be true. Anybody know what Shakespeare play that comes from? It is Hamlet. Very good, Carl. I, it sounds like a Macbeth, but it's not. It's Hamlet. And in Hamlet, it, the character is told, to thine own self be true. Um, and that's, that's humanism. So if it's good for you, this is the I'm okay, you're okay generation from the 70s. If it's good for you, it, it'll be good for those around you. So if you build a better house, everybody's going to celebrate that you've built a better house. Except for the neighbor who now you block their view of the lake. But see, they're, they're mean people anyway. You don't, really don't care about them. And I will say, it, the first uh, Humanist Manifesto was written in 1938. Right between the two wars. And Humanist Manifesto one has a clause in it called the, the no harm clause. So you can do whatever is best for you, but you can't hurt somebody else. You can't do harm to somebody else. So you couldn't build that house if it blocked your neighbor's view of the lake because you knew that would do him harm. So you would build it so that he still had a view of the lake, but you still had your house. Manifesto 2 comes out in the 70s, right in the middle of that whole I'm okay, you're okay movement. I think it's 77. Um, and in Manifesto 2, you do no great harm. It's still the same. You know, no harm. Well, but great harm. So, you know, yeah, you know what? People are going to be offended, so don't worry about that. The third Humanist Manifesto comes out in 2000. It's the, the millennial uh, manifesto. Not, not dealing with the millennial generation, but on the millennium. And in it, there is no no harm clause. It's just figure out what's best for you, follow your heart, and do it. Um, and, and see, and that's one of the that's one of the teachings, you know, uh, that really resonates with our people today. I have to look out for myself, right? You know, um, whatever your feelings on Roe v. Wade. What do you hear being yelled in the city square? My body, my choice. It doesn't matter what anything else says, but it's my body, my choice. Um, and so many of the issues that get people going, it's all about what I decide is right for me. doesn't matter what you think, 
doesn't matter what you care about. And it's kind of what I was talking about Sunday. We need to start these discussions where we sit at the, down at the table and at least look at uh, opposing views. So the conversation can go on. We can understand where, where we are. Right now, we are, we are no closer to a, a coming together. The false teachers of today seek to divide us into little groups. And it's groups that are similar in thoughts, similar in actions, similar in skin colors or whatever. But they seek to divide us, and they think that's what we want to hear. And so they're very popular. Christianity, on the other hand, is not love thyself, but love thy neighbor as thyself. Uh, and Jesus, by the way, changes that around, love one another as I have loved you. Puts a further onus on it. Again, you've got to go back to that cross. Every day is Valentine's Day for the people around you, which means every day you live your life for somebody else. Now, how many of you really want to hear that message that you are to live your life for other people? Barb. Right, and yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to devolve into the issues I've mentioned, right. you know. But the, you know, within within those bodies that want to discuss it, there are those that proclaim to be Christian yet go against what it's. Again, that's false teaching, you know. Uh, and they'll say, well, yeah, that that part of the Bible doesn't matter. That was written so long ago. It's an old document. You know, we really really need to get some, some people together and write a new Bible. <laughs> yeah, this is so outdated. We need to write a new Bible. And it's kind of like, I don't think so. But when we look at the false teachers, though, it, it, it's easy to fall into their trap. So how are false teachers guilty of denying the sovereign Lord who bought them? From verse 1 of... Uh, of 2 Peter 2. But there are also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false prophets among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. So I'm going to go back to the Catholic Church. I'm not meaning to beat up, beat up on the Catholic Church. What? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, going, I'm, I'm going right there. How does one know that they're going to heaven in the Catholic Church? Who says they're going to get to heaven? There's only one person. Pope. Currently Pope Francis. Um, and he does that through the cardinals and the bishops and the priests. But it's the Pope that says you go to heaven. By the way, if you died today and you were a Catholic, would you be in heaven? No. Purgatory is not in heaven. It's neither heaven nor hell. I know, but that, that is the doctrine of the church. That's the teaching of the church, and it's one of the teachings that Luther was so against because he saw it as a ploy to, I'm going to use a word here that's maybe a bit more harsh than it ought to be, extort money out of the people for their dead loved ones. And that, I mean, when you read the 95 Theses, Luther makes a very big point of that, that... You know, if it's all about saving souls, why doesn't the Pope open the coffers of the Vatican and buy all the souls out of purgatory? Because, by the way, the richest bank in the world at the time of Luther was the Vatican. So Luther's point was, 
And by the way, he had been to Rome. He'd, he'd seen all of what Rome was and St. Peter's that was being built and all of that. Um, so if, if it's all about salvation and paying for the sins and paying for the sin, paying for the sins, and why doesn't the Pope pay for the sins of the, all the believers and thereby send them to heaven? See, and there, there, there you get that hint of he's trying to draw money out. Well, remember, the average, average age, roughly, of adulthood in Luther's time, 35 to 40. If you made it to 40, you, you lived a long time. Luther actually lived a little longer than that, but see, he was in that upper crust. Uh, but the average person, because of the plagues, because of... Uh, the lifestyle, the food, and, and or lack of food, um, just wars that would go on, uh, the average age had dropped down so low that the Catholic Church is saying, we're not getting enough money in. And we're trying to build all these cathedrals. We don't have the money. How can we do this? That's when they resurrect the uh, indulgences from uh, the first Lateran Conference of the, the 1100s. And they say, well, we can sell these indulgences and, and buy people out of, people can buy people out of purgatory. And that's, that's what sets Luther off, okay? Um, if that's the case, if it is the Pope that says you're, you're qualified to go to heaven, what does Jesus have to do with that? Nothing. You satisfy the Pope. If indeed the statement I made, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, what does Christ have to do with that? That's it. There is nothing I can say that changes that. Now, I, I, I could go on, and by the way, I've always said anything you add on after that is, um, the, the equation is the cross plus what equals salvation and if the cross is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ what do you add to that anything you add there diminishes that right believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess to the priest your sins uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and give to the church. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and do good works. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and buy indulgences. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and go on a crusade. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and have a building named after yourself. Anybody want to have a building named after themselves? We'll build a new building here. Um, but see, anything you add here, it seems logical to say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and do right. Or believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess your sins. Or believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and go to church. But see, these are results of this, not part of the equation. The cross brings about in us those reactions. They're not part of the equation of salvation. Salvation comes from this. Jesus Christ died for me. All right? So this always has to be a big zero, nothing, cr the cross plus nothing equals salvation. It's faith in that cross. And you get, people try and put faith here. But see, faith is already back here. You know, and so in the algebra equation, this has to be nothing because salvation is found nowhere but in the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the true teaching. That's the sovereign Lord that we worship because he bought us. Right? The cross is when he bought us. That's what Peter's saying. Peter's very familiar with sin. Peter's very well with being, very knowledgeable about being bought out of sin. You know, um, some would say that Peter was at the cross. I don't see evidence he was. Um, I, at least no, nowhere in any of the, the narratives does Peter, is Peter mentioned. John is, but Peter's not. But uh, he certainly, when Jesus looks at him, 
after he has taken an oath and said, no, I don't know the man, denied him the third time, he feels that death of the Lord at that moment. And that's why he goes out and, and weeps. But see, Peter understands that there's nothing he can do to save himself. He can't take those words back. But it's the death of Jesus that does, and it's the fact that Jesus welcomes him back in. You know, yes, Carl. He, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Okay, what it is, and, and you have to look contextually. Peter is talking to a group of people, and the church is just forming. They need that sign, that symbol. And so he lays it out there, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized and you'll be saved. But then he comes back with he that does not believe will be condemned. So is it really baptism that saves you? I mean, yeah, the, the, the apostles do say baptism now saves you. But, but if you look at that statement, what is it that really saves you? It's not the cutting off of the flesh, but it's the pledge of a good conscience. Is your conscience good when you're baptized? I, a poor, miserable sinner, right? We all learn that we are sinful and so in need of a, a Savior. We would be lost unless saved from sin, death, and the power of the devil. We just heard it on Sunday. We'll hear it again on this Sunday. What are the only thoughts of an infant? I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm wet, I'm dirty. Give me that sharp, give me that shiny item over there. Who's the most important person in that child's environment? Me. It's humanism. It's humanism in its purest. And I'm sorry to say that about kids, but in infants it is. Now, being baptized doesn't necessarily change that. They don't after they're baptized, all of a sudden, oh, mommy, I'm hungry, but you go take a nap because I think that you need to lay down and rest. <laughs> if they did, probably mommy would go down and lay, lay down and take a rest because she'd be flabbergasted, right? Yeah. Um, but see, you're right. They don't know that. And so they can't make that pledge of a good conscience. Neither can the parents because each man pays for his own sins unless God pays for them. See, to me, that pledge of a good conscience is God coming alongside that child and saying, this child is now mine. Who can fight Satan better? Us or God? If that child is saved from sin, death, and the power of the devil, God better be standing beside that child. To me, that being baptized is having the Lord beside you. Remember, anybody remember the movie Aladdin? The old movie Aladdin with Robin Williams as the genie? You know, and Aladdin rubs a lamp and, 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 and the genie is going through this long list of all the benefits of having a genie on your side and all of this stuff. And you, you see him dancing around and he, you know, popping all these things. That, you know, that's... No, God's not a genie. I'm sorry, don't go there. God's not a genie. But having God on our side, there is no more powerful person to stand beside us in the dark times and the light. He's the only one that can defeat Satan, and that's why if Satan is, is on your tail and Satan is trying to get you to give up, you just have to call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's standing right there beside you. And then he goes to battle for you. That's where the faith comes into me. What? Can you, can you be saved without baptism? What's a Bible verse that proves you can be saved without baptism? No? 
If baptism was required to be saved, what would Jesus have done for the thief at the cross? Oh, hey, Dad, stop the clock for a minute. i got to baptize this guy. Magically, water would have come out of the ends of his hands. He would have baptized that thief while on the cross and made it so. Think about it. If baptism is requisite to salvation, Jesus would have had to do that. Right? Have I, have I now done a false teaching? Corinne. When, when, when did you pay for those sins? Okay. So what, what it, what's the purpose of confession in our worship service? <laughs> Most people would feel better if I didn't have confession in the church service. By the way, another thing that the prosperity churches don't have is confession. No, there is no, there is no confession in the prosperity churches. They have good music. Yeah, they have good music. Yeah. You sound like you've been to one. <laughs> yeah. Where, where is that relationship with God? Other than what God's our sugar daddy. But, all right, so getting back to this. The purpose of confession is that we might realize that without God we are lost and condemned creatures. That When we say the confession, um, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. Okay, but I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them and I pray you and the in this innocent suffering and death. So we, we, we confess our sin to throw ourselves on God's mercy and to remind us of that mercy. It's why we have crosses all over the place in our church. If you look at the ascending Christ, at the back of the church, he's not ascending like this. How is he ascending? What's it remind us of? The cross. If you look over to the, well, it'd be your left, my right, there's a cross there. If you look up behind the, the altar area, there's a cross. If you look on the altar, there's a cross. We need to put one on the choir side so that we're surrounded by crosses. Um, but you know, that cross is there to remind us of what Christ has already done. We confess our sins so that we might be reminded we are not that poor, miserable sinner, but we are the beloved of God that he already paid for those sins. How many of you carry scars with you? Physical, physical scars. How many of you carry spiritual scars? Things you've done that just keep bugging you and bothering you. Are, are, do you believe that those are forgiven? Yes. I would hope. I would hope. You, I would hope you understand that. On the cross, Christ washes us clean of all sins. But they keep bothering us so that we'll be reminded that we have a way to live and, and a way not to live. I've told a story before about my thumb that I really shouldn't have. I should only have about a half a thumb. Because one day I'm working on the table saw. Yeah, people cringe when I say it. But I had just pushed the board through. On I used this hand for pushing. And I then reached down and hit the button to turn the, power, the saw off. And I reached up to grab the scrap. And I always would grab the scrap and throw it off to the side so that it wouldn't get caught on the blade and kick back at me. My father had an incident where a board hit him in the center of the chest, coming off the saw blade, so I'm, I'm always very careful to throw it, throw it out there so it doesn't come back. Well, 
this time I was pulling it back. Who knows what I was thinking about? And I let my thumb drop instead of keeping my thumb tucked in. Let my thumb drop, and the tooth of the saw blade caught me right at the knuckle. And I mean, it was a it was a torn up mess. Doc Reed said, "I don't know if I can put this jigsaw puzzle back together, but I'm going to do the best I can." He said, "But I, you have to understand, you're probably going to have." A stick for a thumb. You'll have a thumb, but it won't be usable. I said, well, do whatever you have to. And by the way, I do still have full motion. Thank you, Lord. Um, but I, I have that scar there. And every time I turn a table saw on or any other my power equipment, it twinges. Why does it twinge? To remind me, think about what you're doing. This, the next time you may not be so blessed that it just catches a piece of your skin. I heard a story about a man that, you know, July 4th, everybody sh shoots off fireworks. By the way, there, there's a lot of bad stories out there, but this guy was holding a firework in his hand, he light, lighting it, and then he was going to throw it. The fuse burned too quickly and went off. He lost the first two fingers on both hands, th this thumb, half of this thumb, and then half of the ring fingers. Carpenter. Or he was. He was, he's not anymore. Uh, but, you know, we, we need those reminders. And so our confession is, is not to buy forgiveness. It's to remind us of that forgiveness that has already been done. Um, opus op Opus operatum, opus operandi. Uh, two Latin phrases. They sound the same. Opus is work, right? One is the work being done. The one is, a, it's a past participle, the work having been done. We always look at it as our confession is about the work that has been done, not the work that is being done. The power in the sacrament is always not the work that I'm doing, but the work that Christ already did. You know, everything goes back to that cross of Jesus Christ, and, well, in, in the case of the Lord's Supper, it goes back to the, uh, the upper room when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. Everything we do is all about that. You know, if we, ever, if we ever start to think it's about us, and why, it's why I, I back off of that, you know, well, yeah, but you have to confess your sins in order for them to be forgiven. No, you have to confess your sins in order to be reminded about what Christ has already done for you so that that, that Band-Aid can be applied and you can get on with your life. And also you can learn, don't do that again. Um, and so when we look at that, if indeed the sovereign Lord has bought us, that means he's paid for the, the full price is all of our sins are gone. If that's the case, then, you know, other things are adjunct to that. Um, what would you say to somebody who said they believe, but they're a serial killer? They lead a secret life. They're in church every Sunday. But on Monday, they become the secret killer. Would you believe them when they say they believe? Their works don't, don't coincide with what they say their faith is. And by the way, we all sin, and I, by the way, I'm picking on, on serial killers, but we all sin, and we, we indeed deserve nothing but God's wrath. We, we don't belong in his kingdom of ourselves. But we do belong in his kingdom because he proclaimed it. And that is the true teaching. If I teach you anything else other than total reliance, Jesus only, total reliance on Jesus. Uh, by the way, one of the five solas, you know, sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia, sola Christi, Sola Deo Gloria, Luther's five solas. Oh, by the way, it's faith alone. There's no works involved. 
if I say, well, you have to confess, I've just added a work to it, right? But see, the reason I could say that is it's grace alone. God's grace, not mine. It's not that all of a sudden I'm this wonderful, loving person, and so God says, oh, well, you, you'll, you'll do well in my heaven. No. God would probably look at me and say, I don't know what I called you for. Uh, but it's because of what he's done that I am what I am and, what, and you are what you are. And there, therefore we live in that. And we baptize in order that. And, and it's always been my firm belief that in Lutheran theology, when a child is baptized, that Holy Spirit is placed into their heart. To sit there and to, to watch the seeds being planted and to, to water those seeds and to culture those seeds so that they may spring up into something beautiful. Now, does that happen at age two or three? Does it happen at age 16 or 18? Does it happen at age 40? I don't know. Right now I'm trying to get grass to grow. You know how hard it is to get grass to grow in Florida? <laughs> my homeowners association is on my case about I've got bare spots. They want me to put sod in. It's kind of like if grass seed won't grow, sod's not going to grow either. I'm going to have to pour gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons of water and waste water. I'm not doing that. Um, so I've been, I've been putting grass seed down and watering it and watering. So far, a month in, I have no grass. I don't think it's going to happen. But maybe. Just maybe. It will. And see, we can look at those children that are baptized. And, you know, we've had a few baptisms. I was telling one of the, the brother pastors, I had a meeting last Thursday, uh, last Wednesday. And I, I was telling one of my brother pastors about all the baptism. We we. Had, we have 11 baptisms scheduled. I mean, we average two or three a year. And it's kind of like, what, what is happening? Well, our preschool is a big part of that. They're learning about Jesus. They're learning how important Jesus is to them. And the parents are saying, we want Jesus to be part of their life. And so we've got all these baptisms. Now, when will that sp seed spring up? I don't know. I'm going to tell a story on, on one of them. Um, was at their house after the baptism, and the, the mom and dad were talking to me, and we give them Bibles. As Well, we gave them Bibles at, at graduation. The preschool gave them a Bible. The church gave them a Bible at their VPK graduation. And then for baptism, we give them a Bible. So, I mean, this one child has gotten three Bibles from Christ the King Lutheran Church. Because he got two when he graduated from BPK. And he just got a third one. It's just a, it's a 120 Bible stories. And it's beautiful. I, I give those to the older baptisms because beautiful pictures. Absolutely gorgeous pictures. You can sit and look at the pictures and tell the story. Anyway, and I was talking to mom and dad and, and they were talking about this child wants to hear Bible stories every night. He's got his favorites, but he sits and he listens to two or three Bible stories every night. And it's, it's because of what happened at our preschool. You know, and that seed is growing. You know, and, and, it, and, we, and it's, it's why when we reopened the preschool, we said it's going to be a Christian preschool. How can you have a preschool that's part of our ministry and not be a Christian preschool. And so it's putting that seed there. But I don't control when it springs up. Wendy doesn't control when it springs up. The parents don't even control when it springs up. The Holy Spirit does. And the Holy Spirit is patiently waiting for that seed to sprout at just the right time. And who knows when that will be for these children. I don't. 
But you know what? I celebrate every one of those baptisms because they are now part of God's family. And that seed is there, and it's a powerful thing. And so that's, that's the, the importance of baptism, Carl. Um, it does not, I, I'm not going to say it saves, but it, it certainly places that relationship with the Lord on the, the front burner of that child's heart. Um, I, w- I was going to look up the exact reference and, and try to get the context of that story. I'll do that for next week. We're at time. Uh, but I know Peter was talking to a specific set of people. And things were done a little differently in the early church because they didn't have, they did not have this. They didn't even have the Old Testament. And so there had to be a lot more signs and symbols. Mm hmm. Right. Right. Um, I will say, at the time of Jesus, their knowledge of the Old Testament was probably fairly good because the generations carried that tradition on. Um, They didn't sit around and play video games or watch movies on the tube. They sat around the fire in the evening and tell us again that story of Samson. Tell us again the story of Joseph. Tell us again the story of Maher Shalal Hashba. Longest name in the Bible. Maher Shalal Hashba. Um, But, you know, in all these things, the, the parents and the grandparents are sharing with that child that knowledge, and so they they had a better knowledge of it than we do. Um, And by the way, I'm going to say something about Lutherans. Lutherans are probably the worst at biblical knowledge. Not not this group. (laughs) No. Yeah, but you compare us to the Baptists. You watch Baptists going into their church, and what's everyone got in their hand? Oh yeah, you know, and they are they are deep in that Bible, and um, I, I'm not faulting them. You know, um, I like to say, well, Lutherans because of their whole catechesis and all of this. They learned enough of the Bible that they carry it in their brain. <laughs> and, and, and Carl has the other side. <laughs> yes, Carl? Right. The non-liturgical, the non-liturgical churches do lose a lot because that those psalms and those portions of scripture that we use in our worship every Sunday are to remind us of that dwelling with the Lord and of the things that God has said to us, you know, and we are um, the fifth Sunday in July. We're going to try something. There's an order. We haven't used it here for many years from what I understand. Um, We're going to do Matt. But we're not going to do the canticle. We're, the rest of Matins we're going to follow. But I'm not sure that Christ the King Lutheran Church, Orlando, Florida, is ready for the Venite and the Te Deum. The, it, it, it's taken six months to teach him the Nunc Dimittis. Um, but we're going to use similar, similar songs in that for the Venite and the, uh, the Te Deum. But we're going to follow the order of Matins. And I like Matins because it's so rich in the word. You know, it concentrates itself right down on that word, uh, the, the Psalms and the, and the scripture and the responses 
Um, and so uh, it, it, that's what we're going to do. On, we're going to try that for the fifth Sunday. And if that holds, we'll do it on every fifth Sunday then. We'll have matins. And we may eventually start working towards the Venite and the Te Deum, um, which I, I personally, I love singing them, but not many people do. Um, you, you really got to work yourself into it. Um, but that, that's something we want to do because it is a, another of, of those liturgies that's very rich uh, in our heritage. And so we're going from there. So I will look up that verse and come in with the contextual on believe on Lord, believe and be baptized. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who believes not will be condemned. And why Peter says what Peter says. So let's close with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, in our world today, there are true teachers and false teachers. We pray that we may always look to the scriptures to see those who are the, the pure and true teachers and set aside those who are not. That always we may look to that, Je that redemption that is ours through what Jesus has already done and that in everything we may know and may keep close that blessing you give to us. Be with us, Heavenly Father, as we live as your children. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, we will not have Bible class next Thursday. Shelley and I will be out of town. Uh, but then in two weeks, we'll start with verses 4 to 10. I encourage you to read that on your sheets. Uh, and we'll, be, we'll go on with 2 Peter 2, uh, day 2, next in two weeks. All right? Thank you.